Well, good evening. Good evening. Oh, that's so good. I love that. You guys are awesome. It's great to have you all here. I'm Tom Curran, and I'm here with my lovely wife, Carrie. And just want to thank you all for come on, coming out to this, uh, well, this prayer meeting that we're doing. Why are we doing this? Why are you here? What is this all about? I'm going to start with a story, and that story is going to lead into a simple conversation that you guys can have with someone next to you. And so this is, again, if you haven't been here, these sessions tend to be a little bit more interactive, where you don't simply sit back and listen and take in, but you have an opportunity to engage in conversation because it's about growing in faith. It's about growing in faith. And um, after we have our little opening conversation, we'll have a chance to dig into what's going to be the simple flow of the evening. Okay? Why are we here? The dessert. The dessert. <laughs> Joe, it's called a rhetorical question. Okay? <laughs> I wanted an answer. I'll tell you the answer. Okay? <laughs> All right. I was on an airplane uh, flying to go speak at some conference somewhere. And uh, there was a woman sitting next to me. She asked me, where was I going? And I said, I was going to go speak at this conference about God. And she said, oh, really? And I said, I said yeah. And she seemed pretty enthusiastic. And so I said, well, do you believe in God? She said, yeah, I do. And I said, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? She said, no, not at all. And so I said, well, are you satisfied with your relationship with God? Are you satisfied with your relationship with God? And she said, oh, yes. I said, well, tell me about who this God is. And she described God as this energy that is somehow the source of all that exists in the world. And I just took it all in, and I thought, oh, that's very nice. And then I said, can I ask you another question? Yes, absolutely. And I said, is God satisfied with his relationship with you? <laughs> she didn't really like that question. <laughs> is God satisfied with his relationship with you. And she said, I don't know. And I said, well, this God that you believe in, do you know this God? Does this God know you? Does this God have a plan for your life? And if so, is God satisfied with his relationship with you? And I said, can I ask another question? <laughs> I said, one more. <laughs> and I said, are you willing to do something about it? Are you willing to do something about your relationship with God? Because even if we can say yes, are you satisfied with your relationship with God? Yes, but I think maybe the reason we're here is that maybe we're quicker to say, no, I'm not satisfied with my relationship with God. And boy, that second question, if we, if we can get over the hurdle of the first one, the second one is maybe a little bit more pressing. Is God satisfied with his relationship with you? Well, the third question, are you willing to do something about it? Yes. Okay, great. Well, here's my last question. Are you willing to let God do something about it? Are you willing to let God do something in your life to help you grow in a way that will satisfy God? Because God is easily pleased with you, but he's not easily satisfied. He has more. And I think if I had to say there's a common thread or theme to why we're here, it's there's more. There's more to what God wants to do in our lives, in our homes, in our families, and through our lives in this moment in the world. At least that's why I'm here. We have this sense that there's more. And the question tonight is, are we willing to let God do something about it? Okay, now, Here's a statement, and I'm going to have you talk about it. And the statement is related to the experience that Kerry and I had coming out here tonight. Did everybody have a really pleasant, easy, no obstacle path out to getting here tonight? Yeah. Any of you have any difficulties, troubles, little obstacles getting in the way? 
I cannot believe all the things that got in the way between Kerry and I getting here peacefully and on time. So here's my question, and I want you to talk about it. The statement is that a life with trials, difficulties, and suffering is more blessed than a life without trials, tribulations, and sufferings. Let me say it again, and I want you to discuss it. Is this true? And if so, how have you seen this to be true? Here's the statement. A life with trials and tribulations and sufferings is more blessed than a life that is free from, that doesn't have trials and tribulations and sufferings. Is that true? How have you seen that to be a statement that has lived in your life? And just take a few minutes to discuss that simple statement. A life with trials, tribulations, and sufferings is more blessed than a life without trials, tribulations, and sufferings. All right, so the, the goal that we have for these sessions is all about coming to experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit that God intends for us to have and to live in our lives, that without the power of God's Holy Spirit in our lives, we won't be able to do what it is he's asking us to do. Last week, we started on that journey, focusing in on the love of God and how this love of God is encompassing. And we focused in on the intimate, personal, profound, and life-giving relationship with God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That each of these persons of God is drawing near to us in the world around us, in the events of our day, and within us in order to love us, that to be is to exist in the reality of God's love. And so that's where we begin. Where we're headed is towards the empowerment with God's Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so if we can, as Catholics, as uh, disciples of Jesus Christ, come into that inheritance of the Holy Spirit in a whole new way, then we will be able to fulfill what it is God wants us to do. So. Today I'm going to focus in on the, uh, a theme of, I call it the missing middle. Um, and let me just start with one little one. I like to kind of give little points of teaching. I know some folks enjoy this sort of thing. That um, the uh, morning offering, how many of you make a morning offering? It's a, it's a great spiritual practice. When you get up in the morning, first thing you do, make a morning offering. And there are lots of morning offerings. But the traditional structure of a morning offering is Trinitarian. And it eventually involves three statements. And the, the three statements are, God, you are God and I am not. However else you're going to start your morning, you're starting it off by getting first things first. God, you are God and I am not. The second statement is, Lord, this is my heart's desire. What the Lord wants for us as we are growing in our relationship with him is that we would have the confidence, we would have hope, real confidence that Jesus wants us to break open our hearts and to pour them out before him as we're launching into our day. So I encourage you to open your heart and to just bring it all there, to pour your heart out. Lord, this is my heart's desire. And the third statement is, lead me, Lord, and I will follow. Lead me, Lord, and I will follow. And that's all about this wonderful drama of a life-led by the Holy Spirit, right? Life led by the Holy Spirit, that St. Thomas Aquinas says that there are only two powers that can move you from the inside. There are lots of forces that will attempt to influence you from the outside. And we'll talk a little bit about those tonight. But from the inside, there are only two forces that can move you. What are those forces? Well, the first is, guess what? You. Ta-da, right? God has made you a person, and so you are called to take action, to enact your own life. What's the other force? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in you in such a way that he can move you into action, and thus the drama. Today, the actions that you took, were they actions that came from a source that was you, or was it the Holy Spirit? And so... The fundamental idea of being docile to the Holy Spirit. 
the willingness to be led by the Holy Spirit is going to be something we're going to reflect on more fully as the weeks go on. Okay? So when we think about this idea of the, of the call that we have as disciples, we often will hear about and um, reflect on two dimensions. The fact that we're called. God called you into existence. God has a plan for your life. We talked about that last week. And the fact that God then empowers you. Where he calls, he graces. Where God calls, God graces. Because he's not going to call you to do something or to be someone without giving you the strength to do that. We get that, right? Acts chapter 1. Go and uh, proclaim the gospel to all the nations, to the ends of the earth. But don't do it until what happens? The Holy Spirit comes upon you. Then you'll be my witnesses. Acts 1a, right? This is the call, but don't fulfill the call until the power comes, right? Who remembers Moses and Joshua fighting against the Amalekites, Exodus 17, right? So they were fighting against the Amalekites, came and and attacked them. Now, where did Moses go when the battle started? Went to the top of the hill. And what did he do? He raised his hands in prayer. And when he raised his hands, guess what happened? Joshua was winning, right? And when he, he got tired and his hands lagged, guess what happened? Joshua started losing. So you needed the prayer, here's the call, we've got to fight the battle, but let's get God's power to win what God asks of us. Okay, we see that all over the scriptures. But there's something missing. And it's what I call the missing middle. There's something that stands between call and empowerment, where he calls, he graces. Well, what stands between the call and the power to fulfill the call? The answer is, the experience of powerlessness. Oh, what a happy group. (laughs) Tonight we're gonna focus on that part of discipleship that we often overlook, avoid, or begrudgingly undergo. And that is the trials, the tribulations, the sufferings the things that make life really difficult. I used to give great talks on how to raise teens before I had any. (laughs) I now have five. And when Carrie and I think about what was it that got us here? Why are we here, not just here tonight, But here in Eastern Washington, it wasn't because, sorry, any natives that are from the area, it wasn't our lifelong dream and goal as we grow and advance in our career to move to Spokane Valley. (laughs) That was not on our radar screen, okay? That is not why we are here. We're here because we were suffering. We were here because we were powerless. We were here because of our radical poverty. And somehow, that was a gift. Somehow that was used by God to be the source of an immense gift. But it's not something that we're quick to choose. It's not something that we, like, Please, Lord, I don't have enough of the experience of powerlessness. Please, Lord, I want more of that. Right? But but when we we talk like that and think like that, it's so easy for us to want to say, I want to live in the first part of discipleship, the call. Lord, just love me. Oh, I want to know the love of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Bring it on. And then I want to hop over powerlessness and jump right to empowerment. Oh, Lord, give me the power to go and evangelize. That's what I want. Lord, that, I want to just go from victory to victory. And yet, in doing that, we're missing the essential middle, the essential middle to God's kingdom. I, now, I just, I called it the essential middle. Now, is that too much? Is that too strong? Is that an overstatement? Well, let's take a look. Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount. It's the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is living under the protection and provision and the care of God. Do you want to live under the protection and the care of the kingdom of God? There's one way in. One way in. Through the blessing of poverty of spirit. And I think sometimes when we hear poverty of spirit, we too quickly say, oh, that has nothing to do with material reality. It just has to do with the interior experience that we need God. If you take a look at the scriptures, you'll discover that in many instances, where the call becomes empowerment is literally through the acknowledgement, the fundamental uh, realization and, and speaking out loud of the limitation of the inability, of the incapacity. It's all over this sense of scriptural calls. Abraham, you called to be a father of many nations. Uh, I don't have any kids. Okay, Sarah laughed, right? Yeah, really, father of many nations, good luck with that, right? Um, who else? Uh, Moses, well, we're getting there. <laughs> Moses, right? What about Moses? Oh, go set my people free. Uh, Lord, I can't speak. I'll send you Aaron. Uh, I don't want to go. I, I just pick someone else. Right? Isaiah, uh, whom shall I send? Right? Oh, Lord, I can't go. I'm a man of unclean lips, among a people of unclean lips. Jeremiah, who's going to be my voice? Lord, I am too young. Mary, you're going to be the mother of the Messiah. How can this be? I don't know man. Time and time and time again in the scriptures, you see this common pattern. I'll give you a call, but in the experience of that call, you'll come up against the radical experience of your own powerlessness, incapacity, inability, and what it will lead to is an openness to God so that his power will then come. So let me give you a scripture that you've heard it before, but hear it now in the light of what I just shared with you, this experience of powerlessness. It's Paul. Remember the thorn in the flesh? Right, the thorn in the flesh is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 to 12. He says, therefore, that I might not become too elated, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, an angel of Satan, to beat me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I begged the Lord about this, that it might leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in powerlessness. The power is made perfect in powerlessness. I will rather boast most gladly of my weakness in order that the power of Christ may dwell with me. Therefore, I am content happy with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I am powerless, it is then that I am strong. That's God's mercy. That's God's mercy. When we come up against situations that unveil to us areas in our lives where we believe, we got this. We got this. Then God, in his mercy, might bring a trial, a difficulty, a suffering to your life 
that might unveil his greater work he wants to do in you. So for Kerry and me, it was about four years ago that we were facing one of these teenage daughters who was doing a great job of, let's see, uh, disobey, uh, fall away, run away. And it left us overwhelmed, overwhelmed. And guess what happens when we have a daughter that we love dearly and we poured our lives out for and living in the midst of a bunch of other kiddos and watching this unfold, this overwhelming thing, it tested what? Our relationship. It tested our relationship. I, I, I joked about, we gave great talks about being teen, uh, parenting teens until we uh, had some. Well, until we had a trial, a real trial, a serious suffering, a broken condition that we couldn't just overcome through, oh, let's just do this, and now it's all solved. What did it do? It drove us to our knees. It drove us to our knees. And it, it, it left us in, in a sense of, here's the, here's the scriptural idea. Praiseworthy desperation. If I could wish something for you in your life, it's praiseworthy desperation. You've never heard that phrase before. You see, because you could be desperate in a way that leads you away from God. That's despair. God doesn't want anyone to despair. But God loves us enough to bring us into places of powerlessness in order that we might become broken down, broken open, emptied out, so that he can then come in in a new way. In a new way that he wouldn't be able to had everything been all nice and neat and comfortable and together. Carrie and I would have been able to continue to give talks at marriage events from up high on the stage above everyone, <laughs> looking down and feeling compassion upon those who struggle, if only they knew the secret to good parenting. How easy would that be to condescend? And now we were descending. And the things that we did that worked, oh, the ways that we would work together as a couple, those things started to be in conflict because of the way the devil was impacting her. <laughs> that was too easy. You shake your head. No, I'm up here. She sits there. Oh, this is going to be a long night. Oh. The ride home's getting worse. I know. <laughs> I'm walking. She's driving. Yeah. No, it's... Uh, let, let me ask you this. Like, the, the attacks that were coming against our family, it, it put us in the crucible. It put us in the furnace. And the things that we did that worked, and when times were easy, they stopped working. They wouldn't work when the stakes were higher and when the suffering was greater and the, the disobedience and the, the, the challenges were, were overwhelming. And it broke us down to a place where we needed to reach out to help. Oh, what a humbling thing. No, what a blessing. Praiseworthy desperation was an incredible gift. Easy to receive? No. Did we ever say rejoice for another day of praiseworthy desperation? No. But to know that God would meet us at that point of powerlessness. He would meet us in the trial. Right? What we learned was this. You heard a talk, I'm sure you heard many talks, where it's like, God will protect you from the difficulty. He'll be with you in the difficulty. He'll see you through the difficulty. But did you ever hear that God will meet you as the difficulty? That's what we discovered. That God met us as that difficulty. 
as that cross, as that trial, as that overwhelming sense of, oh God, we need you. And then come to find out, this is all over the scriptures, <coughs> Old Testament, Second Chronicles, chapter 20, learn the story of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, right, the king uh, of Israel, here he is, and he's got three enemy nations coming against him, right? And you hear what they say, like, here are the three warring nations coming up, and they're coming to destroy his people, coming to destroy Israel. And he says, Lord, see how they're now repaying us. We left them alone when we had the power. Now they're coming against us, uh, coming here to drive us out of the possession you've given us. Oh, our God, will you not pass judgment on them? We are powerless before this vast multitude that comes against us. We are at a loss of what to do. Hence, our eyes are turned toward you. And so all Judah stands before the Lord, little ones, wives, old men, young ones, they all turn to the Lord. And then the spirit of the Lord comes upon the prophet Jehaziel, son of Zechariah. And he says, listen, all of Judah, inhabits of Jerusalem, and King Jehoshaphat. The Lord says to you, do not fear or lose heart at the sight of this vast multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Go down tomorrow against them. And the story goes on. They go down. He says, you're not even going to have to fight. You don't even have to fight. And they go down and they witness these three armies coming up against them. And they're like, we're still powerless. And what happens? Two of, the, two of the warring people say, well, why don't we destroy the third one because then we'll have more to share of the victory. Sure, let's do that. So the two against one, and then once they destroy that one, they're like, well, wait a minute, let's get it all for ourselves. So they destroyed each other. Israel didn't have to do anything, and evil outclevered itself. And God showed himself victorious. Second Maccabees chapter three, another one, Onias the high priest, here he is, the high priest, and the uh, Heliodorus gets sent by the ruling king to take out the treasury from the temple. And, and Onias says, I can't. P people have entrusted this to God's temple. You can't take it. And Heliodorus said, well, me and my army says we can. So we're going in. And what does Onias do? He acts in praiseworthy desperation. He falls on his face just falls on his face and cries out to God and says, God, we're powerless. We're powerless against this army. You have to protect. You have to protect what you have established. And it's an amazing story. Second Maccabees 3, you read it. Because Heliodorus goes in there and all of a sudden an angel comes in, two angels come in and they start beating him up and his whole army flees. And it says that Heliodorus was left powerless and lifeless on the ground, having dearly experienced the sovereign power of God. Whoa. I mean, it's an awesome story, right? And what unleashed God's power? Praiseworthy desperation. Praiseworthy desperation. Now, I want to give you guys a chance to talk about this briefly and say that some of the portals, some of the doorways through which praiseworthy desperation might, meet, might reach your lives are through the three enemies of our spiritual life, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. So as you think about your lives, as you think about the state of the church and the state of the community, where do you see the biggest attack coming from today? The three armies coming against us are the world, the flesh, and the devil. What of those battles make you come to a place of praiseworthy desperation? Talk about that theme, world, flesh, devil. What are the enemies, the, the enemy armies that are coming against your life, your family, this community that you think we ought to focus on, okay? Talk about that and we'll come back. So, um, uh, what I want to focus on now is we're going to wrap up the sharing is how does the experience of praiseworthy desperation come to our lives? And our tradition says it's in one of two ways. Okay, First, there is that which holds back praiseworthy desperation from us, and that's called lethargy. 
or scripture will call it lukewarmness, or sometimes it's called the spiritual deadly sin of sloth. And that's where we just have a resistance and a reluctance to pursue God as our highest good, as the joy that we're made for. And so, frankly, we're just weak, lukewarm believers. That's one of the reasons why we don't experience praiseworthy desperation. In other words, we're comfortable. We're comfortable. Life's pretty good. Hey, relax, huh? Dial it back a little bit. Mm-hmm. Praiseworthy desperation, like you want to maybe touch it, but then, you know, pass through. Mm-hmm. Right? When you're going through hell, keep going, right? <laughs> keep going, don't stop, right? So, but that's not what our tradition says praiseworthy desperation involves. So I said that there are two sources of coming to experience praiseworthy desperation. And those are charity and calamity. Charity and calamity. Charity meaning the love of Christ. The love of Christ will make you desperate to save souls. Desperate to reach out with his love. Desperate to live for him alone. It will give you a praiseworthy, holy desperation. It's St. Paul, Romans 9, right? He says, I speak the truth in Christ. Uh, The Holy Spirit uh, speaks to my conscience to say that I would be separated from Christ for the sake of my brothers, the Jews. He'd be willing to undergo hell for the sake of his brothers, the Jews. All that drove him, and you look at how he lived his life, it was the love of Christ impelling him. Right, 2 Corinthians 5, 14. It's the love of Christ that impels us to live that way. And that's often where renewal comes. It comes from saints who are impelled by the love of Christ. And I think that's part of the moment we're living in. We have a passionate desire to see Christ glorified, a passionate desire to come into the more that God has for the church for today. But if we don't respond in the timing that God gives, and the world continues to be marked by the impacts of the world, the flesh, and the devil, God loves us too much to allow us to stay comfortably on the path to hell. He loves us, he loves his children too much to continue to allow them to be slaughtered and confused. Frankly, God loves the children of the state of Washington too much to allow comprehensive sexuality education to continue. He does. He will rescue his children through charity or through calamity. I would rather avoid calamity, right? However, I know the gift of calamity it was calamity that reached my family's life that gave us holy desperate, praiseworthy desperation and then brought us to a place of refreshment, of recovery, of renewal, of new life. We wouldn't be here. And maybe some of you wouldn't be here either. Gee, isn't that interesting? How God moves, right? It, you know, it, like it says, one of these simple truths you all know, and you've heard it before. God took the worst thing that humanity ever did. What was the worst thing that humanity ever did? Killed the innocent son of God. God took the worst act in all of human history, and he turned it into the greatest act in human history. He took the cross and made it the resurrection. He took the act of killing the innocent son of God and said, I'm going to redeem the world through your worst act. So if God can take the worst thing that humanity ever did to redeem the world, he can take care of the trouble that's reaching your life. Right? So that's what we want to live. How do we come to experience the charity of praiseworthy desperation? Read the office of readings. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. The Liturgy of the Hours, the Divine Office. You know, there's an order to the office, right? Right? There's the first, uh, there's morning prayer, midday prayer, or mid-afternoon, mid-morning. And then there's evening prayer, night prayer. And then there's the Office of Readings. Do you know the order, the traditional order? What hour is read first? It's the Office of Readings. Do you know when it's read? Middle of the night, like four in the morning. The monks get up and they pray the Office of Readings. Well, when you read the Psalms that the church gives in the office of readings, it's, 
Oh Lord, hear my plea. I am powerless. Tears have drenched my pillow. I am completely overwhelmed by what's happening in my life. Please God, rescue me. You know who's praying that? A bunch of nuns and monks who are in monasteries. Well, guess what? Are they desperate? No. They're, well, maybe they're tired, right? Uh, but they come and they pray those prayers, and then they go back to bed. But it's the word of God. And when you pray the word of God, one of three things will happen. You will either memorize the prayer in a way that it just lacks power. You will pray it and say, oh my goodness, I don't want this to happen. And you'll stop praying it. Or you'll become it. You'll become the word you pray. The word will take flesh in your life. And so if you want to experience praiseworthy desperation, don't go seek trials and tribulations and sufferings. They will find you. Right? You don't have to seek them. But if you begin to pray this way, if you begin to pray this way, you'll begin to have a rise in you what is the ultimate source of praiseworthy desperation. It's the sacred heart of Jesus. It's the heart of Christ that is crowned with thorns, pierced, bleeding, crowned with a cross and a flame on top. When the sacred heart was revealed to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, it was revealed in such a way that she was asked to give her heart into the heart of Christ. Do you remember the image? She said that, her heart was like a tiny atom entering into this immense fiery furnace of love. And that her heart would be not just warmed up, not even just inflamed, but completely transformed into his heart. Do you know what will happen if you begin to pray for praiseworthy desperation? You will become a manifestation of the heart of Jesus for this world. That's what will happen to us. And you can say many things about that kind of life. There's something you won't be able to say. It's not lukewarm. And so we frankly are living in a moment that requires Catholics that are on fire. Catholics that are on fire simply to sustain the faith of, of ordinary Catholics. If we just keep doing what we're doing, it's a recipe for calamity. I don't want calamity. So Lord, bring us charity. Bring us the love in your heart. Make us that love through praiseworthy desperation. Don't figure it out. Just start praying the word of God. Let that word come into you and you will begin to feel a passionate love that will begin to take over your life. So um, I want to give you one last way to pray this way that's connected to praiseworthy desperation. And then I want to give you guys a chance to share what struck you about tonight. If you have an insight, you'd like something that struck you or a question you have, okay? And then we'll fellowship. So um, the last insight is this, that if we can be tempted to fall into comfortable living of our life of our faith, the way that I have been taught to pray a whole bunch of years ago by a very holy pastor was this, is that there are certain parts of our lives that we repent of. We say, Lord, please change me, right? But there are parts of our lives that just don't want to give up, don't want to give in, don't want to give over. And so the prayer is, Lord, conquer in me all that resists you. <laughs> conquer in me all that resists you. What's that? It'll kill me. And, and, then, and then you'll rise, yeah, right, to a exactly. whole new life, right? Because we can say, Lord, I give you my whole life. No, I don't. Right? Lord, I give you my whole day. Well, maybe 15 minutes, right? Uh, Lord, I want to give you everything, but there's so much of me that's still in rebellion. And so, Lord, please conquer in me all that resists you, okay? Let me close in prayer, and then you guys can share just for a couple minutes before we get to the end. Um, and then we can fellowship and you can leave. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord our God, we thank you that you have called us out of love into being and that you love us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and that you have power that you long to release into our lives. And Lord, that tonight 
You've given us the grace to reflect on the reality of powerlessness, radical incapacity to follow you, to say yes to you. And so, Lord, we look to you tonight to give us mercy and comfort for each and all of those in my midst, all of us here, any of you that are experiencing an overwhelming, traumatizing situation that is leaving you desperate. I pray that the Lord would give you a nearness, a sense of his presence and power, that he is with you as the trial in the moment of desperation. And Lord, I ask for those of us who are in a place that is, that is good and strong, that you'd fill us with that burning love of your heart, that we would help ward off calamity by living the charity of your heart in a whole new way. We say yes to that, Lord. In Jesus' holy name, amen. amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.